But we want to go back and look at it again tonight, if you will, in the third chapter of the book of Daniel. <clears throat> I think probably all of us know the subject matter that is in this uh, third chapter and the incident that happened and the three Hebrew children in the fire furnace. That's not an unusual scripture setting for us, and we are well aware of what happened. <clears throat> but uh, it does us good to go back and rehearse. It's not the things in the Bibles that we don't know that uh, uh, gets us all stirred up sometime and helps us. It's the things we do know that we just need to be reminded. <clears throat> and uh, perhaps tonight we want to... Uh, we want to uh, probably do something I don't think I've ever done before. Uh, after I get to preaching here a little bit, I want to stop and read to you uh, a part or an excerpt from a message of a preacher that everybody here has either been in their meeting or you know about them. And I want to see if there's anybody here that can... Uh, uh, can identify who the preacher is. <clears throat> Amen. You might be surprised. Uh, I want to say tonight, holiness is still right. Does anybody here believe that? Holiness is still right. Holiness is not a dirty word. Holiness is a Bible word. <clears throat> And God is holy. And he said, Be ye holy, even as the Lord our God is holy. <clears throat> Amen. So let's read tonight uh, <clears throat> for a few minutes from this third chapter of Daniel. Amen. <clears throat> and let's begin at verse 8. And we're going to read on down several verses before we quit, and, and, uh, but we want to uh, read the Scripture. There, Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music <coughs> shall... <clears throat> shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fire furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they, then they brought these men before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, then at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, but the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast in the same hour into the midst of the burning fire furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that, that we will not serve thy God, nor worship the gold Im image which thou hast set up. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> this is a wonderful story of the providence of God. God still has everything under control. We want to uh, take our thought tonight out of verse 17. Amen. I want to 
shift that verse around just a little bit in its wording, not doing any injustice to the Scripture, but perhaps just for our thought in our text. The Scripture said, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. I want to talk to you tonight about our God is able. Our God is able. He is able tonight. There's no, there's no dilemma that has come your way but what God is not able to take care of you. I want us to remember <coughs> the scripture setting tonight. Amen. <coughs> This wonderful city of Jerusalem, which is God's city, where he chose for his name to dwell. It is called the city of God. <clears throat> it is geographically the absolute center of the whole world. And uh, God chose it to put his name there and to build his temple there. And uh, for the people of God to magnify the name of the Lord in that place. Now all of us are aware of the fact that Israel uh, became uh, uh, lax in their experience with God and their worship. And, uh, and because of that, God allowed, <coughs> amen, uh, these other kings to come and plunder it. And take the people into captivity. Amen. And uh, this, this great city of Babylon. Amen. This huge city of Babylon. Long ways from the city of Jerusalem. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar. Amen. He got all of his uh, military might together. And uh, he being probably the proudest king. And the greatest king of that time got his men together and he led uh, his uh, best soldiers to Jerusalem across the desert sands of the, de of the Sinai Desert and, and invaded Jerusalem, took it, tore down the walls of the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, amen, and carted their best in the prime of their young people off as captives. We're all familiar with this story. It's not uh, any of us that, that don't well remember the, uh, the military uh, uh, trips that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar made with his battering arms and rams to, uh, to defeat the city of Jerusalem. Amen. But among the captives were these three Hebrew children that has become common household names to every Christian. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hardly any of us remember them by their Hebrew names. We re have remembered them by their Babylonian names. Amen. But uh, I think as these <coughs> Hebrew captives were being carted off in chains, and in such a savage's book in her story, The Long Journey, she describes it pretty vividly. Amen. Perhaps they might have reached a, uh, a high hill somewhere on that desert sand and looked back to the ruined city of Jerusalem. Amen. And they might have quoted the words from the Psalms. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, if we forget, let our right hand forget its cunning and our tongue cleave to the roof of our mouth, yet we will not forget thee. <coughs> Amen. And uh, weeks later, amen, these captives entered the city of Babylon. Amen. They were captives in a heathen land, a foreign land. And uh, they were led down uh, later on to the banks <coughs> of the river. Amen. R Euphrates. And, and these curious Babylonians that had heard, amen, the songs and how these Jews would worship and sing and play music, said to the uh, uh, Jews, amen, uh, play on your instruments.
take your harps down from the willow trees and play us a song. Amen. Sing for us some of the songs of Zion. Amen. And they replied, How can we sing the songs of the Lord? Amen. In a strange land. Amen. Oh, I want the Lord to help me tonight. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, amen, had hardly got themselves situated in this foreign land until, amen, they were notified that the king had, amen, commissioned that everybody come and worship the image which he had set up. Probably an image of himself. Amen. He had now declared that he was king and that he was God. Amen. And all the other Babylonians were bowing down and worshiping Nebuchadnezzar, a man. Amen. And uh, they were worshiping him as God. Amen. But these three Hebrew children, uh, they stood their ground. They refused to bow. They refused to, amen, bow to the ground and worship the image. You see, because they had a law that God had put in their hearts while they were young. It was instilled in their soul. Thou shalt worship no other gods. Amen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. They were commanded to worship only the true and the living God. They had a law that was higher and more important than the law of Babylon. The law of Babylon said, worship the image. Worship Nebuchadnezzar. But God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they had that embedded in them from a child. They had that instilled in them as a child. They had a conviction in their heart, amen, not to worship any other god but the god Jehovah. Amen. And they refused to bow. Help me here tonight. I want to tell you. Amen. I read these verses again today. And I come to the realization that your experience with God is going to be tried again. Yes, it will. Amen. We are in a different age. We are living in a different society and a different culture. Amen. But I can promise you the trials you're going to face is just as difficult for you to overcome as what it was for those Hebrew children not to bow. Amen. We are seeing more and more people in the American church bowing. Amen. To the gods of this world and giving in to the temptations that have come their way when God said... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Somebody say amen. These three young men came face to face with an inescapable amen fact. True religion is going to be tried. Your convictions is going to be tried. (coughs) And it really didn't matter whether they were in Jerusalem or whether they were in Babylon. Amen. The devil was after them in hell. And it really doesn't matter to you. Amen. Whether you're in church or at work. Amen. Or with your friends. Your experience with God is going to be tried. We'll find out what you're made of. God's going to find out what your amen temperament is. God's going to find out whether... Amen. It is a conviction or a preference. God's going to determine whether your experience is genuine or whether it's just a surface religious experience. Amen. I want to tell you, we're living in a generation now, right now. Amen. Where your experience with God is going to be tried. Amen. Perhaps not by a fiery furnace. Amen. But by ridicule, by making fun of you. Amen. By your closest friends, your family. Amen. Come on here. Trying to convince you, you don't have to live godly. Amen. I want to tell you, your experience with God is going to be tried no matter where you live. 
Amen. It, you see, it don't matter whether you're in Babylon or whether you're in Jerusalem, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Mexico, whether you're in Canada. Amen. It really doesn't matter. Amen. Where you travel. Amen. Your convictions is going to be tried. It doesn't matter whether you're in church, whether you're at home, whether you're on the job, whether you're with your relatives, whether you're with some of your friends. Amen. Your convictions is going to be tried. Amen. I'm seeing more and more, and you are too. Amen. People are severely tried. Even people that attend church here and other holiness churches, their convictions are going to be tried. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow. They said, we will not bow down. Amen. The, uh, you know, there's always somebody that's going to tell on you. Amen. Amen. I said, amen. If you mess up, there's going to be somebody that's going to rat on you. Hello. And if you stand firm, somebody's going to tell, amen, that you won't bow. Amen. Which one had you rather be said of you? You won't bow? Amen. Or you will bow. Which one did you rather have said? They stood and lived by their convictions when they were alive. Or they was just a whimsy. Whichever way the tide goes, whatever happens, amen, Who's, whoever they're with, that's what they are. Any old dead fish can float with the tide or with a current, but it takes a live fish, amen, to go against the stream and against the current and against the tide. Hey, man, why? You don't have to be nothing to stand for nothing. Hey, man, you've got to be something to stand for something. Hey, man, you've got to have something inside of you. Hey, man, that says, I will not bow. The devil will come to you from many different angles. Hey, man, this here, this here uh, Nebuchadnezzar king, Amen. When it was brought to his attention that there were three Hebrew children that would not bow. Amen. They, they were brought before the king. Amen. He explained to them what was going on. He said, I'll give you a second chance. Amen. When you hear the sound uh, of the dulcimer and the flute and the sackbut. Amen. And all the musical instruments. You bow down. Okay. I'll give you a second chance. But if you're not... If you don't, you're going to be cast into the uh, fiery furnace. Amen. What was their answer? What was their reply? They said, we don't have to have a second chance. Amen. We don't need a second chance. Our mind is already made up. God, Jehovah, has said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. Throw us in the fire, if you will. But we just want you to know that our God is able. Praise God. I want to tell you tonight that our God is able to bring you through the trial. Some of y'all here tonight, some of y'all are going through some trials, the worst trials you've ever faced in your whole experience with God. Amen. You wonder how long it's going to last and how things are going to turn out. But I'm here to tell you that our God is able to bring you through every trial. Amen. As gold that's tried in the fire. Amen. And he'll not leave you alone. Praise God. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Nebuchadnezzar is saying to these three Hebrew children, Who are you to defy my orders? I captured your city. Amen. I conquered your army. Amen. I've got a whole stockpile of gods out here. Amen. I've got a whole stockpile of, of countries that I've defeated. Amen. And brought in subjection all over this world. Amen. Yeah, come on here. 
Hey, man, their gods didn't deliver them. What makes you think your God's going to set you free? Hey, man, it said, when I conquered your land, hey, man, I didn't find your God anywhere. I didn't find any likeness of your God anywhere. I didn't find an image, hey, man, anywhere in any temple in Jerusalem. <coughs> Somebody say Amen. Hallelujah. You are serving a God that does not even exist. Praise God. As the three Hebrew children said, Amen, our God is able to deliver us. Amen, from the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. Our God whom we serve is able. Thank God. Our God is able. The angels in heaven is saying, Our God is able. Amen. The saints of the past centuries, Amen, in one voice has said, Our God is able. Say, saints, Amen. Can't you and I get a hold of the same promise and say, Our God is able. And he is. I said he is. Don't let the devil discourage you. Don't let him tell you, hey man, that God is not able, for he is abundantly able to deliver. Hey man, I can tell you tonight that we've got saints of God that's gone to glory out of this congregation. Hey man. And if you could talk to them tonight somewhere in the glory world, amen, you'd hear, whoo, you'd hear Robert Dotson say, our God is able. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. You'd hear Albert Pullen say, our God is able. You'd hear Claude Willard say, our God is able. Praise his wonderful name. Amen. You'd hear Brother and Sister Tharp say, Our God is able. Amen. You'd hear Sister Fraser say, Our God is able. You'd hear Lee Horton say, Our God is able. Say, saints, uh, Amen. I want to tell you tonight, Our God is able. Hold on to what you know is right. You'll never be disappointed by trusting God. Somebody say amen. Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew, they knew God was able. They didn't say in that just to bolster their image, make them to look good. They wasn't doing that just to make them look spiritual. You know, some folks do things just to make other people think they're spiritual. That wasn't their purpose at all. Hey, man, they had a law written on the tables of their hearts that said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they knew... You hear me? They knew that God was able. Somebody say amen. You see, the prophets had told them lots of times, God is able. The psalmist recorded, amen, hundreds of times about God being able. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Hey, amen, Hebrews, when our backs was against the wall, Come on here, somebody say amen. And the Egyptian army behind us, and the Red Sea in front of us, and the mountains on one side, and the desert on the other. Our God made a way through the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh's army. Amen in the Red Sea. Hallelujah. Amen. And Miriam grabbed a tambourine and composed the song and sang it all at the same time. 
that the horse and his rider is drowned in the sea because the Lord, amen, has marvelously intervened. God is still able. You ever feel like you're fighting a battle all by yourself? God is able. You ever feel like you're standing alone all by yourself? God is able. You ever feel like that you're, hey man, the only one in your family living holiness and serving God and the devil's ridiculing you and your family's making fun of you? Hey man, telling you don't have to live that way anymore? I want to tell you, God is able. If you stand for God, God will stand for you. And if you don't stand for the Lord, if you don't stand for the Lord, amen, you don't have any grounds to expect God to stand for you. A compromiser, hear me, a compromiser never wins. Hello. Bible tells us that when they were cast into the burning fire furnace, that these soldiers of the king that threw these three Hebrew children into the fire. Bible tells us that they were burnt up, consumed, and they weren't even in the fire. They were just the soldiers that threw the Hebrew children into the fire. Amen. I ask you a question tonight. Who were these soldiers? Amen. Can I tell you? Amen. That they were the ones that was closest to the king. His most trusted men. Amen. They probably polished his boots. Bowed before him. Did his bidding. Whatever he told them to do, they did it. He said, come, they came. He said, go, they went. Amen. Come on here. What did they get out? Amen. Of serving their king like this. Heathen monarch king. Amen. Amen. When they got close enough to the fire to feel it. Amen. They were too fragile and become combustible. And they burned. Compromisers pay an awful price just to fit in with the rest of the crowd. Go ahead, bow, but you'll burn. Hello, bow and you'll burn. Bow to the pressure. Amen. Give in to the trials. Succumb to the temptations. Amen, and you'll burn. Amen, you'll be consumed in the fire just like these soldiers were. Amen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we may burn, but we won't bow. Amen. Amen, they were willing to suffer for their convictions and for their God. Amen, but they were not willing to bow. Amen, in homage to a wicked king that God had said, you don't do it. Amen. And they found out if they would not bow, God would see to it that they did not burn. Amen. Compromisers always burn. I want to read your quote. It's going to be lengthy, several paragraphs. Found this of my readings. Now I'm going to ask you, who do you think preached this? Some of you would know. Some of you have been in the meetings of this man who preached this message. And I quote from page 12 of his message, which he preached just exactly as it is written in this book. Many people in the church are compromising their testimony 
Old convictions, once dear to the heart of the church, are being stifled. And in their place, there is compromise. Many outstanding ministers who once preached under the anointing of the Holy Ghost have bowed to certain groups in their midst, and today they are burning. I smell the scorching of human souls. I smell the fire. Hey, man, I smell a fire is on our garments. I charge the church with three grievous compromises. Number one, Bible holiness, heart purity, clean living, separation from the world, holiness of life. The word holiness has become an abomination unto us. We have turned up our nose to holiness. We are ashamed to use that word in our preaching and in our conversation. But God loves holiness. Holiness unto the Lord is one of the famous slogans of the Bible. The Hebrew writer urged the people to holiness when he said, Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. <coughs> the experience of sanctification which produces holiness of heart and life, has become a byword, something to be looked down on by the ecclesiastical groups. But God says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. I think I see signs of a turning back to holiness, even among some of the churches who have been so hostile to it. They are beginning to realize that to have power you must first be holy and set apart from the world. The only successful way to handle the problem of worldliness in the church is to preach Bible holiness until our people have become holy. Do you all believe that? Say amen. Hallelujah. Somebody said, I get tired of hearing holiness all the time. Amen. Your heart must not be right. And I continue. No man can be separated from the world until first he is separated unto God. Holiness of heart is a pure love for God and a holy hatred of sin. Holiness is the dividing line. It is the great separator of the spirit from the flesh, heaven from hell, righteousness and sin. Worldliness is selfishness. It is living as one pleases, doing as the world does. Worldliness is an attitude that permeates the whole life. We look on a person who is living a worldly life and say, he is worldly. We have observed his bad habits, his intemperance, and by those acts declare him to be worldly. He is manifesting what he is within there is no use to preach to him that he should quit his bad habits. We must show him the way of holiness, directing him to consecrate his life to God so that he can be sanctified holy. God will then take out of his heart the very appetite and desire for worldly things. Holiness cures from within. It is the glorious liberation of the whole life from any impurity and from all worldly desires. And it is the redirecting of the life in those channels of unselfish service to mankind. In a word, holiness is unselfishness. But no man can be holy until first he consecrates his self and is sanctified by the blood of Christ. Can anybody say amen? We must make room in our doctrines, in our preaching, in our church emphasis, in our daily lives for Bible holiness and selfishness of heart and life. Does anybody know who this preacher might be that I'm reading from? Amen. Keep thinking. <clears throat> no. Amen. But you're getting back into the right, right time frame. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. He said, I charge, charge the church with 
compromising the powerful experience of the upper room. And the Holy Ghost and fire which the disciples received on Pentecost morning. No one knows the importance of the Holy Ghost like God does. He commanded the disciples to tarry until they were endued with power from on high. For he said, Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The baptism of the Holy Ghost then was a definite thing to be received. The, the, the disciples were commanded to tarry before the Lord until they received it. They were promised it in a few days. They actually received it ten days later. And when they received it, things began to happen. Two more paragraphs. Amen. Does anybody know who the preacher of this might be yet? Keep thinking. It is important that they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. But more important than in receiving the Holy Ghost as a personal endowment of power from on high, they were fired up and empowered to go forth to the people preaching the risen Christ whom the people had just crucified. It took a lot of courage and power to face the howling mobs that crucified their Savior. But the Holy Ghost supplied that power. The baptism of the Holy Ghost did many things to the disciples. Three of them stand out above the others. This experience gave them power to win souls. It gave them power to heal the sick. It gave them power to stand persecution. And all these things, they walked in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. God cannot bless us in our compromising. The, sm uh, the smell of fire is on our garments. Amen. The thing that hurts most of all, that is if we would change our attitude and actually tarry before our God and receive, receive the same Holy Ghost experience as they did at Pentecost, we could and win. We could and would win. Amen. Souls to Christ. We'd bring healing to our people. Amen. And would count it the rarest honor to suffer. Amen. Shame for the name of Jesus Christ our Savior. Does anybody know who it might have been? No? No? Some of y'all have been in that preacher's meetings. Or Robert. 1951. 1951 I wonder what he would say if somebody would take that same message and read it back to him now hello amen there is no semblance between what he is now and what he was then there's no resemblance at all. I want to tell you, but he's not the only one. There are a whole host of others. Amen. That most of us could call by, my, by name. Amen. That was a household word among us when we were young people that has fell by the wayside and compromised our convictions and gone the way of the world and bowed. Amen. And succumb to the temptations of the new neo-Pentecostals that anything is acceptable in our generation. Amen. We've learned better. What well, I want to tell you. Amen. When you learn better is when you have compromised. Amen. And taken down the standard of righteousness and holiness which God requires of His people. That's the very reason that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves in Babylon was because Israel, amen, had compromised, amen, and no longer believed in the righteous word of God, amen, their Lord, amen. And we in America is no different. Amen, amen. The pressure is on right now in our own area, in our own churches, Compromise. Let down. You don't have to believe that way. 
Amen. It's foolish for preachers to preach against TV and movies. I'm preaching right. It's foolish for preachers to preach against carnivals. <coughs> Amen. Amen. And ball games. It's foolish for preachers to preach against worldly places of entertainment. Amen. And bowling alleys. And whoo, am I preaching all right? Amen. And skating rings. Amen. We are living in the 1990s. Get hip with it, preacher. Amen. Get up to date. That's old foggish and outdated. But I want to tell you, amen, Smith Wigglesworth, amen, said that holiness, amen, was right. Amen. It was for his day, and it is still right. I said it is still right. Amen. I was uh, saved in the Assembly of God Church. And, and I only say, uh, bring that name just for the sake of making an, an identification of where I was saved. I was saved in the, in the Assembly of God Church. Amen. I was filled with the Holy Ghost in the Assembly of God Church. I was called to preach in the Assembly of God Church. They taught us holiness is right. Sanctified living was right. A separated life from sin in the world was right. Amen. Come on here. Amen. They told us it was wrong. And it was a sin for a woman to cut her hair. They told us it was wrong. An abomination for man to have long hair. Somebody say amen. Somebody said, I don't, I'm not old enough. I remember it. And some of y'all here tonight do too. Hey, man, if you just want to jog your memory bank, I want to tell you, we've got a generation of preachers on our hands that's going to stand before God and answer for a lot of souls that's dying and going to hell because they have deceived them, hey, man, and partaken of the world and the worldly crowd. But I'm here to tell you, God will do again for his children. If you will live right and serve God, and stand the test. Amen. And overcome the pressures. Amen. God will heal your body. Praise God. He'll bring you out of the slums. He'll bring you out of the pitfalls. He'll bring you out of temptation. He'll cause you to be an overcomer if you live for God and live holiness all the days of your life. Get it in your heart. Somebody say amen. I said, get it in your heart. Amen. It can get up here and never be in here. You need to get it in your heart. It's become an experience with God. Somebody said, Brother Seb, don't you think that some people that, that may live worldly in what we do going to heaven, I'm not going to have to answer for them. I don't have to answer for what I know. There may be, help me here. Draw all that with me here. There may be some people that have never been taught, never known. Ooh, it's going to get tight. Amen. That they're living all they know to live. Amen. They're doing everything they know to do. Amen. They're hungry to live for God. They just have not been taught Holiness of life. Come on here. Amen. God will be their judge. I don't even want to attempt to be their judge. Have no intentions of saying whether or not they're going to heaven. That is not my department. Come on here. Amen. But he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. You don't live a life of holiness and separation from sin in the world and dance in the spirit and shout the praises of God. I'm preaching right now. Amen. And then leave everything that's right and everything that's holy and everything that's good and everything that's righteous. Amen. And go to some worldly outfit. Amen. And stay the same. Amen. You have gone backwards, my friend. And you, amen. Come on here. If God's book is anywhere close to right, you're going to be judged out of what you know is right. Quiet in here tonight. I want to tell you something. I believe this with all of my heart. All of my heart. 
we're going to see a revival of miracles and a marvelous healings among the people of God that have served him and living a life of holiness. I've talked to several people across this country in the last little while that have gone the way of the modernist. And they have come to the conclusion, they have acknowledged, they said, it don't work. It's the appearance of being right, but the end thereof are the ways of death and of hell. Do you stand for God? Amen. And refuse to bow. God will see to it that you will not burn. You're being tried right now. Amen. There's a there's a seesaw going on in your mind right now. Amen. Up and down, up and down. You're vacillating back and forth. Amen. What is right? Is this right or is, are they right? I want to tell you, you need to hold on to what you know is right. Let every man be a liar. Let God be the truth. This book is right. Had some young people just recently said, Brother Savage, with all the people and all the voices that we hear, who is right? It's a simple answer. This book is right. This book is right. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's tight, but it's right. You cannot sit at the table of the Lord in the table of devils. Somebody said, I'd never drink of the cup of the devil. When you play with a modernist, come on here. Amen. And you pal with that crowd where anything goes. You will say, I'll not sit at the table of the devil. But you are drinking his brew. And it's debilating to you. Amen. It's polluting your thinking. That preaching right, Brother Savage. Yeah, you are. You're oscillating back and forth like a fan. Amen. Amen. You know, you know holiness is right. But what about these people out there? They say they're going to heaven and they talk in tongues. Amen. And they go to the world. They sip a little. They smoke. Amen. That come on here. They go to the ball games. They say they're saved. What about them? Amen. I want to tell you, he that know to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now listen. Pastoral preaching tonight. Pastoral preaching. You cannot commit sin and go to heaven. Some folks would have you believe that. Hello? The Bible said, He that committeth sin is of the devil. Is that the book? He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Amen. Let him that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. I have read to you tonight out of that little book that Oral Roberts preached 
There's five sermons in here that he preached in the 1951, 52, and 53. I've read to you what he preached then. He meant in what he preached then, God honored and God performed miracles and healings by the droves. Somebody say amen. Are y'all listening to me? Amen, amen, amen. Jack Cole, when he was preaching, amen, I've heard him say on tapes, amen, I've heard him say in his preaching, amen, the harder he preached against sin, the greater miracles that God performed in his meetings. God honors holiness living and holiness preaching. You think that I get too plain? You ought to have heard some of the preaching of Jack Cole. Where there was 15,000, 20, 30,000 people under his tent meeting. Amen. In his tent revivals. Amen. All kinds of people come. He did not allow anybody to come dressed ungodly. And sh- are y'all listening to me? In shorts in his tent revivals. He stopped them at the flaps. He had men, you're not welcome. Go home and get some clothes on. Amen. In Washington, D.C. Woo! Glory to God. In Washington, D.C. Amen. 15, 20, 25,000 people in one church service. Amen. There's a couple ladies that come in service there one night on that tent revival. Amen. They had shorts on. Amen. Help me, Lord. He got up and took the microphone. He said, is there any butchers in this house? <clears throat> Amen. And there in that size of crowd, you know, there's always two or three of every kind of profession in the world, just about it. Three or four of them raise their hands, scatter across the congregation. He said, two of you butchers, catch them heifers back there and dress them. <clears throat> Amen. I mean, he called them heifers. <clears throat> Hit me, Lord. I mean, he's rough on them. Amen. He didn't spare no words, but did you know God honored it? Somebody said, I'd never go to hear him. Amen. I want to tell you, amen, perhaps I don't get that plain as he did in his preaching. I mean, amen, he called them huzzies. That's what he did. Amen. Whoremongers, adulterers. He he called them sluts. (laughs) Amen. He called them whores. Woo! Glory to God. That's pretty brassy, isn't it? Amen. But did you know, hallelujah, that God performed miracles? Cancers dropped off of people's face in his hands. Amen. Tumors disappeared. Amen. The lame was healed instantly and got up and run out of wheelchairs. Amen. Threw away crutches. Praise God. Incurable diseases were made whole. Amen. And he said... The more I preach holiness and against sin, the greater miracles God performs. Amen. Can I tell you, God is right. I said, God is right. Amen. Oh, help me, Lord. The men of the bygone days, T.L. Osborne, amen, preached holiness and saw miracles performed. Amen. And I could name Many, many others that have been gone for years and dead and in the grave. And most of you here don't even know who they were. Amen. But they preached a life of separation in the world. And God performed miracles. Amen. Sad to say, many of them compromised. Amen. Before they died, amen, and lived a life of as loose as a goose. Amen. Oh, God, help me. Now, amen, you want to go that way? Amen, come on. You need to get saved. Need to pray through. Your life is full of misery. Amen, your heart's full of adultery. Amen, you need to get your heart right with God. Amen, if you won't bow, God will see to it that you don't burn. But if you bow, hear me, the very thing that you will compromise over, you're going to lose. Hello. Somebody said, well, I... Hit me, preacher. I went to the dance because my wife said I had to go with her if I wanted to keep her. I got news for you. You're not going to keep them anyhow if you go to the dance.
That's all that's between you and her. You ain't got her. God said, if you won't bow, I'll see to it. You won't burn. Amen. And the very thing you compromised to keep, you let down. Amen. You let down the standard of righteousness and holiness because you want to stay friends with some of your relatives or some of your close friends, dear friends. I got news for you. There will come a time you're going to lose them anyhow. As a preacher, Brother Roberts tells about it in that message. There's a preacher that he knew. <clears throat> Amen. That preached holiness. God healed him in one of Brother Roberts' revivals. Healed him of an incurable disease. Amen. Started preaching holiness and righteousness. And his church came to him. His pastor, good-sized church. And his church men came to him and said, if you keep preaching that, we're going to vote you out. Amen. You cannot stay pastor here and keep preaching like that. And so he thought it over. He thought it over and he thought it over. And he cooled his message and quit preaching holiness. Six months later, they voted him out anyhow. The very thing you compromised to keep you're going to lose. Lee Braxton, which was in the 1950s, early 50s especially, amen, one of the main men of Oral Roberts' ministry, amen, when he was 10 years earlier, he was working on a job for $30 a week. Man came to him, he's an automobile mechanic, man came to him, he fixed his car. He's a good mechanic, perfect. I mean, he knew his business. Fixed his car so good. The man said, I'll give you a job making $70 a week, $40 more a week. Lee Braxton said, sounded good to me. I accepted the invitation. My family needed the money bad. I could pay my bills and not be in such a tight squeeze. Seventy dollars a week. A lot of people now make more than that in one day. Hello. He said, "I accepted the invitation and said, I'll, 'I'll I'll come to work for you. I'll manage your shop.'" The man said, "That means you'll have to work on Sunday." Lee Braxton stopped and said, "In that case." I'll keep my job. I work here at thirty dollars a week, though my family could use the other money. <clears throat> Hello. You see, now's the testing time whether it's a conviction or a preference. Whether you prefer to, whether it's just whether something you'd rather not do or whether it's really conviction in your heart. Oh, that's good preaching. Lee Braxton said, I turned it down immediately. I didn't even have to think about it. The man said, you're crazy. He said, I kept working. I went back to my job at $30 a week, my auto mechanic, just on, just a regular mechanic in the job. Two weeks later, a promotion came along, and he said, in that promotion, that I got, I was making much more than $70 a week and didn't have to work on Sundays either. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. If you will not bow, God will see to it. You won't burn. Woo! Help me, Lord. Somebody say amen. We need men and women with convictions in their heart, not because the preacher said so, not because it's a church creed, amen, but because it's in their heart. They want to please him that has called them to be a good soldier. 
And whether they have a preacher that preaches it or not, they live it because it's in their heart. Amen. Amen. Anybody. Anybody. Woo! That's good preaching. Anybody can watch movies. But it takes a Christian with conviction that says, I will not bow. Anybody, anybody can tell off-color dirty jokes. But it takes a Christian real Christian to say I will not bow anybody whoo come on here hey man anybody anybody can go to the entertainment places of the world in the ball games and the f- baseball and football and basketball stars and follow hey man their lives day by day and dribble by dribble and Amen, ball by ball and throw by throw. Anybody can do that. But it takes a Christian, a real Christian in their heart, says, I will not bow. Amen. Anybody can go along with the crowd. Amen. And because somebody else does, you do. But it takes a real Christian to say, I will not bow. But if you will, you have a promise. Neither will you burn. God, God may allow you to go into the fiery furnace, but he'll insulate you with asbestos. Amen. Amen to where you will not burn. And while you're in the fire, You'll never feel the sting, amen, of pain. He'll see to it. Praise God. Aren't you glad you're saved tonight? Let's come pray. Ask God to help us in our generation. Serve our generation. Be a light in our generation. Be different in our generation. Lift up our standard in our generation generation. Serve God in our generation.